Hello, everybody. Welcome to Beersmith Podcast number 45. Got a great show for you today. Uh, just a reminder, uh, get a lot of questions now as we enter the brewing season about how to get started with Beersmith. And one of the best ways to do that is go to beersmith.com slash video, where I have videos on how to get started with Beersmith, including setting up your equipment, creating your first recipe, and how to scale recipes and do a number of other things. Uh, my second announcement for today is I've entered beta testing on our light Beersmith app. I know a lot of people have been asking for a mobile app compatible with Beersmith. Uh, the Light app is going to include cloud access as well as a brew day timer. It has a number of tools built in as well as reference material for brewing. It's going to be available for Android, iPhone, iPad, uh, and Android tablets. And we're hoping to have that available in a little over a month if I can get it approved through the stores. Uh, and that's going to be followed a few months later by the full app which will allow recipe editing and creation. So there's going to be a light app and then a full app. And now, we're out of, without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Randy Mosher. He's the author of Radical Brewing, Tasting Beer, and he's also working on a brand new book we're going to talk about uh, near the end of the show. Yeah. He has a website at RadicalBrewing.com. Randy, it's great to have you back on the show. Yeah, always great to be here, Brad. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. So I understand you just got back from uh, Brazil, is that right? Yeah, I did a week down there in August. It was uh, lovely. And you were out touring breweries, is that right? Well, I was down, I'm doing some uh, beer flights for a bar in Sao Paulo called Melo Grano. And uh, we were introducing the beer flights to the public and some journalists and things like that. The You know, beer. there are a very few really good beer bars, and this is one of them. And uh, so they're uh, trying to figure out ways to uh, uh, give people uh, not just uh, some good beers, but a, a little bit of education also. So, Did you enjoy a little bit of homebrew while you are down there as well? You know, you know this trip I didn't uh, taste a lot of homebrew. No. Uh, certainly have had it in the past, but uh, this trip was more about commercial beer. Well, can you tell us a little about more, more about the growing uh, homebrew and microbrew community down there? Yeah, Brazil's a lot of fun. I mean, they're it's a huge country. It's actually bigger than the continental United States. Wow. Uh, so it's really, really vast. And there's, uh, I think, about 200 million people there. So there's a lot of people. And, of course, um, it's not all middle class, but there's a very large uh, and growing um, you know, middle class. And one of the things they're looking for is something interesting to drink. So uh, they uh, have had some very uninteresting uh uh, industrial lagers for quite some time, but uh, in the last five years or so, there's really been a lot of interest in making good beer, and just like in the U.S., the homebrewers are driving a lot of uh, the innovation and the passion, and and uh, a lot of homebrewers who uh, have have labels for their beer and names for their homebreweries and and uh, big dreams about uh, getting some uh, uh, some money and getting some getting a license and getting open and brewing, and and a lot of them are doing it, so it's very exciting to see. Now, like, like here in the United States, I've seen uh, pretty strong growth from South America. A lot of interest, uh, is certainly from my business side and um, oh. uh, across South America. What do you think is driving the, the, the growing business down there? Well, I think part of it is just, uh, uh, you know, they've gotten through. They had some years of bad political trouble a few decades ago, and, and you've got a lot of younger people who are uh, well-educated and are traveling some. Brazil, the economy is extremely strong. So people have a little bit of money in their pockets, and uh, you know they're looking for uh, all the things that we look for: some fun, some entertainment, some great flavors, some 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 passions to pursue. And uh, so, I, I mean, I, I don't see a lot of differences as far as that goes, as far as why people are interested in what's going on. It's just uh, they're a little bit behind in a lot in some ways, but uh, they're right up to speed in others. It's just a matter of quantity now and uh, really getting getting that public uh, turned on to great beer. Well, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that uh, many of the breweries down there are starting to experiment with uh, local flavors, culture, and cuisine. Can you, can well, you, you talk for a minute about, uh, give about that? Yeah, like all the Western Hemisphere, our beer tradition was pretty, their, their beer tradition, like beer tradition here, was sort of dominated by German lager brewing uh, for a century or more. And uh, again, as people have traveled, as people have gone both to Europe and now also to the U.S. tasting beers, and they're they're wanting something more, but they're also trying to figure out ways to make those beers uniquely Brazilian. 
And I've got a number of people that I've been working with and just sort of hammering hammering at them on the ideas. Like, you guys ought to put some Brazilian ingredients. You ought to do some things that are that no one else in the world would do and really try and uh, find your voice and find uniquely Brazilian ways to uh, make beer and some uh, interesting flavors. And, and you know, the people uh, in the marketplace seem to be responding to that. So, so it's exciting to see. So can you give us a few commercial examples of, uh, of some beers that are starting to start to head in this direction? Yeah, sure. There's uh well, there's a, the, my friend who owns a brewery uh, named called uh, Cervejaria Colorado, uh, wonderful guy named Marcelo. And uh, I've been working with him for about five years now, I think, or close to it. And, uh, We've got, uh, he, he's got an India Pale Ale. He was one of the first two India Pale Ales in Brazil. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's using a sugar called Rapa, Rapa, we would say Rapadura sugar, but they don't pronounce their R's in Brazil like R's. They're like H's, so it's Rapadura sugar. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's uh, essentially the same as the Mexican sugars that we get that are hard sugars. And they, the, the process is you just squeeze the cane boil the juice down, and uh, when it gets thick enough, you can pour it into molds, and it will settle, and it will solidify into blocks. And But it does have a different flavor than the Mexican uh, uh, piloncillo. It's a, a brighter, a uh, little bit more grassy, uh, herbal kind of flavor rather than the heavier molasses-type flavor. So it's definitely a unique flavor. And it goes great in India Pale Ales. Most people uh, in the U.S. tend to think of India Pale Ales as all malt beers, but uh, there were you know, there's a very long tradition of adjuncts in uh, British brewing, and uh, particularly in the mid to late 19th century of the use of unrefined sugars. The, I, I have a quote from an uh, old uh, English brewing book that says something to the effect that we love these unrefined cane sugars that we get from the Caribbean because they have this great luscious flavor, and, of course, that carries through into the finished beer. So so they have a good, you know, there's good reasons to, to use those. They lighten the body a little bit and make them a little more drinkable. So uh, what, what kind of flavor do you get from something like this, the hapadura? Well, you li- it lightens the body up a little bit, and then you get this nice layer uh, that sort of, it's not. It's sort of somewhere in between grassy and caramel, and I know those things don't really relate to one another very much, but it adds a little <laughs> bit of an herbal character uh, and perhaps a, one more layer of flavor that you might think would be some weird kind of malt uh, if you if you didn't know that it was sugar. So so uh, it's not exactly molasses like, but it has a sort of a slightly tangy herbal sort of character to the beer. It's fairly subtle, which is you know all right to use. Uh, uh, Marcelo's uh, also brewing a beer from what they call castanha de Pará, which is actually what we would call a Brazil nut. And those are uh, wild harvested nuts. They only grow, the trees only grow in the for, in the wild forest. They, they can't be uh, cultivated for some reason. And that was actually uh, brought to him as a home brewer by a, a home brewer named Ricardo Rosa. And uh, uh, they uh, decided to brew up the home brew batch into a full-scale batch. And uh, that's... Um, they used a thousand dollars worth of Brazil nuts in the in the in the beer, and they roasted the nuts. How, how big was the batch? Uh, fifteen barrels, I think. Oh, okay. And, that's and still so quite a bit. Yeah, that's a lot of that's, that's a, lot a lot of Brazil nuts. <laughs> and they barrels. toasted them, and and the the fumes from toasting uh, Brazil nuts kind of just about chased everybody out of the brewery. But it's a dark brown, uh, a dark brown ale. Uh, fairly rich and full flavored, not quite a porter, but definitely kind of heading in that direction. So what? I mean, this, so how? What, what kind of? What do you actually get from the Brazil nut? What what drives that? What, what well, does it drive uh, into the beer? It's nutty. It's nutty, and it it adds a certain really luscious richness to it, and a kind of a nutty, toasted, nutty kind of kind of flavor to it. Uh, quite lovely and uh, uh, really enjoyable. And, and he's, he's making he's making beer with. Um, uh, he's got some uh, uh, orange blossom honey, and he's that's uh, local to the region that he's in. And he's got uh, some coffee that a friend of his grows uh, in uh, Minas Gerais State, which is not too far from from his brewery, also. And uh, he's also doing a, a really really interesting um, imperial stout, one of the first also in Brazil. And he's aging it. Uh, uh, he's got different versions of it, but but one of the versions of it is actually aged in. Cachaça barrel or, or barrels that were would have originally been intended for cachaça, which is the local uh, sugarcane juice rum, and uh, made of a wood called imburana, 
that has a really, really nice uh, woody, perfumey kind of aroma. The the beer itself has a, a, a special a extra dark black rapadura sugar in it. Wow. And uh, uh, really quite delicious and very, very, uh, very rare beer and quite coveted in Well, you in mentioned Brazil. quite a few different different approaches here. Let's let's walk through a few of them, maybe one at a time. Uh, let's let's sure. start with local honeys. I know, uh, of course, the White House recently published their beer recipe, which included honey. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. There's a hotel here. I think it's the Marriott that's uh, brewing, uh, uh, has a beer brewed for them with the honey that they make uh, in hives that are on the rooftops right in downtown. Of course, honey can be a challenge to brew with uh, at times. Uh, uh, at times, it's expensive, and yeah. uh, and you need to be careful about how you use it. Seems to work best in the secondary, really, as a flavoring ingredient. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're trying to brew a beer with large amounts of honey, you have the problem of not having enough uh, free amino nitrogen and other yeast nutrients. So if you're brewing with more than about, I don't know, I would guess 30% of your fermentables or so uh, as unrefined honey, uh, or as as honey. Rather than malt, you're you're short on ingredients, and the other thing is yeah, you need to start then looking at maybe adding mead mead type ingredient or uh, mead type uh, nutrients to it. Yeah, you to need some kind enhance of the nitrogen and so on. You need some nitrogen, and you also probably need the zinc and some of those other things. And then the other thing is is that with any sugar where you ha or any beer you have a large amount of sugar, the yeast really would the yeast is a little lazy, and it would rather eat sugar that that's simple sugar rather than eat maltose. And if you give it the opportunity, it won't develop the enzymes that are needed to bring those maltose uh, molecules through its uh, membrane and break them up. So it's best, again, to to add sugar a little bit later in the process. So After, after you've sort of finished your, your primary fermentation, yeah, your, after that your first couple down, days anyways. Clear off. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. But, put that in then and, and you get better results that way so local brought, so you mentioned they're using local honeys down there is it a flowering honey uh, i know you know uh, obviously honey takes on the flavor of whatever uh, the bees are bees are working yeah, off of. uh, uh, marcello's using uh, the uh the um uh orange blossom honey now the, the it, it's very interesting right now they're going through some difficulties with honey and the and the because they're having sort of an eu type of uh organization with uh uh, uh, the South American states, it's called Mercosul. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the rules right now is that no animal products are allowed in uh, fermented beverages. And and that's okay. That seems really normal, reasonable. It's like you wouldn't want to put hamburger so in beer. So is honey, honey considered a uh, animal product? An right? animal product, huh? And it's just like caught in this caught in this law right now. They're trying to change it, but nothing moves fast in the bureaucracy in those uh, types of countries. So so Marcelo has to put the honey in at the end of fermentation, after fermentation, really, and hmm. then pasteurize the beer, or it's not allowed. So he's, you know, trying to deal with that. Interesting. I did bring. I bought a bottle of honey at the market in Belém, which is up in the near the Amazon, and this honey has the most amazing smell I've ever smelled. I wish we had. I wish we had like scratch vision on smell the, vision, uh, yeah, smell vision on this thing because it <laughs> smells. It's incredibly floral, and then you taste it, and you get a bit of wintergreen in it. It's just a flavor I've never tasted in honey before. It's just jungle honey. I don't really know where where exactly it came from or what the flowers would have been, but it was quite amazing. So we're wow. thinking about thinking about doing uh, maybe a special cask ale or two with some of our uh, blonde ale at Five Rabbit, and uh, um, you know, condition priming the casks with this jungle honey. And for for those that aren't familiar, Five Rabbit is. It's a, a brewery that I'm involved with here in Chicago, nice. so I've I've gone all Latin. I mean, I've pretty much uh, uh, it's been been a lot of fun. I we uh, launched in uh, May of last year, and we've been uh, contract brewing up to now. But we're building a 30 barrel brewery in uh, South Side of Chicago near uh, Midway Airport. Well, congratulations! Yeah, so it's really really a lot of fun. I have a partner from Mexico and a partner from Costa Rica. And do you, so have, a, do you have a website there as well? It's uh, five rabbit uh, brewery dot com. The number five or uh, or five, yeah. number five. Okay, five rabbit brewery dot com. Five rabbit's an old Aztec name. He's one of the gods of excess. So uh, well, appropriate. You, we you, thought for him. you mentioned a whole bunch of other flavors. Let's talk about. Uh, is it manioc? Is that another? Yeah, manioc. Uh, you know, manioc is the staple starch of uh, Brazil. We would know it here in the U.S. as tapioca. It's the same plant. Wow. And it's it's a root that they grate and uh, 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 rinse the water out of it. It actually has some uh, some uh, cyanide in it, so that it needs to be prepared 
carefully, but it, but it, but it's easy to remove that stuff apparently. And every, pretty much every meal you have in Brazil has some, some manioc uh, in it in some form, whether to mm -hmm. sprinkle on top of the fo food or as little rolls, or they, they have a lot of different forms for it. But M Marcelo's brewing a Pilsner beer, and uh, the name of the beer is called Kawim. And Kawim is a native word for manioc. And Kawim is also the name of a, of a non-governmental organization that helps native people with the, you know, the many problems that they have trying to deal with the civilized world. And so it made sense to me to, you know, why aren't you putting manioc in this beer since it's called manioc? And uh, so that's <laughs> just a little, you know, I mean, that, that one's a little bit more of a novelty. It's very hard to notice uh, very much flavor from it. So it doesn't add a lot of flavor then? It doesn't, but it turns out that there's a lot of different kinds of manioc, and some of them, uh, we were at the market, and they had manioc that was puffed. It actually was like popcorn, and it had a slightly nutty character to it. So he's uh, thinking about what he can do with that in a beer. So that might be pretty interesting to, to deal with. It's just absolutely, really, from our northern point of view, it's this incredible paradise of... of uh, uh, new flavors and, and, and things to work with. So, you know, I'm, you know me, I'm always looking for new stuff, and it was just overwhelming, really quite amazing. Wow. Uh, well, I know local fruits are also popular, and, and, you know, we certainly brew a lot of fruit beers here. Uh, what are some of the ones that work best uh, down there? Well, there's a, uh, a brewery called Amazon Beer that's located in Belém, and they were the folks that we went to see. And they got a very nice operation with a very nice brew pub and a, uh, a, a small production facility in an industrial park. And they're making a number of different uh, a number of different beers. The first one that they came out with was a fruit called Bakuri. And Bakuri, Bakuri has a, uh, a really intense uh, sort of a um, lychee fruit, like rose petal kind of uh, fruitiness about it. Hmm. Very ethereal. And they put it in a light lager, which I, I think is... Uh, uh, pretty appropriate because of, because this fruit flavor is very delicate and and, and they right. just like some of that that fruit in there. They have another another beer or not? I'm sorry, another yeah another beer that's a German Hefeweizen that they add a fruit called Tepera Ba to, and the Tepera Ba has uh, some. Uh, it's a really just a very bright. It's sort of a one of those tropical fruits is somewhere in between uh, oranges and pineapple. Just a really bright, happy, fruity flavor, and then put that on on top of a a really nice hefeweizen. So just, that so that one comes through. I know a lot of fruit flavors don't come through well. It is a problem sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so so um, that's another one they're working with. There's a brewer I think in uh, outside of uh, Belo Horizonte, which is in uh, Sa in north of São Paulo, a little, mm -hmm. uh, who has made a beer with uh, Jabuticaba. Which is a uh, they sometimes call them Brazilian cherries, but they're a, uh, uh, a like a size of a large cherry. They're really deep purple on the out or deep red on the outside. They grow on the trunks of the trees directly, mm -hmm. and they're more of a southern thing rather than an Amazon thing. So you see them around São Paulo and Rio and places like that. People put them in their yards and and eat the fruit, but the fruit's actually white inside, and it has a really deep. Doesn't really taste like cherry, but it's a really deep, rich, fruity flavor. Uh, and uh, so that's pretty nice. Uh, it's it's difficult to find those fruits in the U.S. Uh, we've got a Brazilian importer here that uh, uh, so a few major markets you might be be able to find a Brazilian uh, importer that would have some of this stuff. We're actually starting at Five Rabbit to think about uh, trying to find some sources for fruit pulps and purees and things like that that we can uh, bring some of these fruits in because there's a lot of people. In those in the Amazon and elsewhere in those uh, rainforest type situations that are thinking that fruit might be a really good way to uh, ex encourage people to wild harvest. Uh, Brazil nuts has saved a lot of rainforest because they just can't be grown uh, in in uh, cultivation, and so the only way to do it is to preserve the forest. And there's a lot of these fruits like that that do best when they're left to their own devices, and, and they actually form sort of grove-like uh, uh, associations out in the forest. And so, so there are academics and people involved with uh, the natives to uh, try and promote the use of some of these fruits and nuts and spices and things to 
in or you know as a way of generating some commerce and generating some cash but not in a way that's going to tear up the forest and uh sell off the trees and and turn it all into rubble so so we're looking uh, at getting involved with some projects like that to see if maybe we can uh, have those people help source us source some of those ingredients uh, for us and use beer as kind of a uh, a showcase uh use for some of these interesting fruits so we're hoping that we find some 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 things to work with there I think you mentioned uh, acai and cashew fruits. Acai. Yeah, acai. acai. Is, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we would see it as a, a, acai, but it's acai. Uh, that comes from the uh, fruit of a palm tree. And, and these they're little purple berries. They look a little bit like blueberries, but kind of oblong, sort of maybe cross between a blueberry and a, a black olive. But they are they have a really rich meaty, almost like coconut meat interior, and then a thin layer of extremely dark purple tannic skin, almost like grape skin on the outside of them. And they're extremely nutritious. They have a lot of, excuse me, a lot of protein to them. And uh, they're generally harvested and ground up into a pulp. And it sort of looks like purple chocolate uh, when they uh, when they serve it. So they grind this stuff up and uh, fresh and whole and uh, just uh, drink this purple chocolatey liquid there uh the this amazon beer is actually making a uh, stout with acai in it and uh that's pretty interesting pretty interesting beer too hmm. yeah and that's available uh around the u.s there's uh, another one called temp uh, called uh kupuasu that's a relative of chocolate and that that is uh, w- one of the uh darlings right now of uh, people who are are, are selling superfoods the mm-hmm. acai berries are also because they have a lot of antioxidants and very high vitamin C, I think, and, and if not in that fruit, then and certainly in a lot of these fruits. So, so they're your best bet to find them at the moment would be to look at these, uh, uh, just look them up and look up uh, some uh, nutritional, see if there are people selling them as nutrition. Oh, and, actually, which, while we're on the topic, like, is it possible sure. to find uh, is it possible to find some of the Brazilian beers here in the United States? Well, not right now. But uh, soon, you can, there. I think there's some beers imported by Eisenbahn, which is uh, one of the larger, uh, slightly more industrial craft breweries. But uh, the beers from uh, Cervejaria, Colorado, will be hitting the stores in the U.S. fairly fairly soon. And I know he's importing the uh, Castanha de Pará, the the the, the, the um, uh, Brazil nut beer, and the Bla- the the Imperial Stout with Black Rapadura, and the uh, and his double. IPA, which he calls Vishnu, uh, just a little bit of a jab at uh, Imbev, who makes Brahma in Brazil, <laughs> <laughs> and who has o- over about eighty percent of the Brazilian market. So, uh, so Marcelo has his fun when he can. So, uh, very cool. We've done the labels on all those, all three of those. So we're looking to uh, have those hit the hit the shelves here sometime in the next uh, six months, I think. So, so that'll be fun to have his beers available. On. And uh, they're, they're quite delicious. So, Well, you mentioned uh, also pulling, pulling in some local spices. Can you talk for a moment about uh, some of the spices they have? Yeah, we had a couple. Uh, one, of the, one of the really interesting ones was a spice called Priprioca. And uh, it's nothing I had ever heard of before or had any familiarity with. It's, it's essentially the root of a plant that looks a lot like um, uh, lemongrass. So it's a tall, spiky grass plant with a little flower at the end on the top, and then uh, these really gnarly, hairy kind of root balls. And uh, those little roots have, uh, think of it as like really, really, really weird ginger. And it has a, uh, it has a really intense kind of a super dry spiciness that has a uh, uh, sort of a little bit of some characteristics of white pepper. Mm-hmm. But also of ginger, or if you know galangal, which is the a different sort of a, a ginger relative that's used a lot in Thai and Vietnamese cooking. That's a bit more peppery, so it's a really pungent, peppery, sharp tasting kind of herb. And uh, Amazon beer is using that in a red ale, and and those guys are actually making some noise about importing into the U.S. also, but they're not they're not they're not ready yet. I don't think that uh, they would like to do it. Uh, let's see, any other spices you might want to talk about? Well, the other spice, the other really interesting spice, unfortunately, is illegal to use in the U.S. You can certainly buy it and, and play with it if you want. It's called, in Brazil, it's called kumaru. But uh, in European uh, uh, 
parlance, we would call it tonka bean. It's available in France. I, I bought some in Paris when I was there last year. It's used in in um, confectionaries and pastries in France, uh, where it's legal. Germans have a uh, a limit on it. it. It contains a product called coumarin that is somewhat. Uh, uh, I think it's liver toxic, but it's uh, mm. you know some some potential harm. But it that's in very very low doses, and so I kind of worked out the numbers. And if you if you brewed and even Assuming that m most of the coumarin got out of the bean and into the beer, you'd have to drink at least two beers a day to to reach the German uh, agreed on uh, amount micrograms per body weight kilogram, and and so it <laughs> I think more or less safe to use in small quantities. But it's a really I interesting um, perfumey aroma that's a little bit like um, uh, sort of across has aspects of vanilla, but more aspects of uh, cherry pit that has a, or bitter almond so it's somewhere in that family in terms of those flavors so very very ethereal interesting perfumey and of course it is used uh, pretty widely in in perfumery <laughs> it adds a really exotic kind of touch so so that's a pretty interesting spice and that's a jungle a jungle plant they're they're small look like kind of flat long little bean uh, dark brown sort of purplish brown beans mm -hmm. Uh, but very, very uh, wonderful flavor. So, Randy, is there anywhere in the U.S. you might be able to find uh, some of these ingredients? Is it something you could find uh, well, maybe at a think, specialty store or something I like think, that? I uh, think, you know, unless you're in a major market like New York or Chicago or perhaps uh, South Florida, where you might be able to find a Brazilian import or a Brazilian market that would be able to get some of that stuff for you, I think uh, your best bet is to get on the old Internet and start trolling around and uh, see what you can find. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, again, this is all pretty new to me too. So it was, you know, it was great to go to the market and touch the stuff. And for every one thing I tasted, there were about a hundred things there that I never really got my hands on. So it was very, it was kind of really wonderful, but a little bit frustrating too. I could have spent all day uh, just uh, going through everything and talking to people about what it was. So looking forward to getting back there and, and really digging in and, and also doing our project and seeing if we can, uh, work with the people who are trying to develop these resources in a uh, uh, helpful way for the forest and the people there. So, Randy, one of the big questions I had for you is, you know, you, you find some of these exotic flavors in the food or the spices and so yeah. on. Um, how do you go about actually deciding which flavors to meld up with which beers or which styles, uh, you know? It sounds well, like most of the beers you're working with are, you know, based on an existing style, but then you're you're sort of rolling in these these ingredients to try and enhance the beer. Well, I think it's like anything. You have to really think about what the flavors are uh, of the fruits and how how intense they are. So, or, or the spices or whatever. You, you know, certainly with lighter flavored spices, you want to look at lighter flavored beers, wheat beers, wheat beers. Is, of course, a great base for anything very delicate or light. Triple, also, or Belgian blonde, anything along those lines that are pale pale in color and relatively low in hops. You think about the, the flavors that are in there, and my goal always with specialty ingredients in a beer is to try and lay lay a base so that when you actually put the specialty ingredient on top of the base, that the, that the base beer is doing a lot of the heavy lifting. You know, if you're gonna make a chocolate beer, for example, make it taste as much like chocolate as you can, just with the malts. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the same thing is true with fruits, think about what kind of hops are you using? You, know, you might want to, with a fruit beer, you might want to use a Nelson Savan or a Citra or one of those uh, more Southern Hemisphere hops or one of the newer exotic hops that have has certain fruit characteristics to it. There's actually some new ones from Europe, too, that have berry-like qualities. And so you always, certainly you want to um, stay out of the way of the flavor. That's just rule number one. But also, how can you augment, uh, amplify uh, or echo the flavors in your specialty ingredients with the ingredients that you're that you're working with in your beer, the standard ingredients like hops and malt. And then, you know, also think about what would taste good in a dessert. Sometimes it's, you know, beer has so many dessert flavors. Think about caramel and nuts and chocolate and, and all of these cho toffee and all these sorts of flavors. So a lot of times it's helpful to think about if I were making dessert with this fruit, 
what kind of dessert would I make? And then you think, oh, well, this would be pretty good as a bread pudding or whatever it is. And then you think, all right, well, how can I make bread pudding or pie or croissants or chocolate cake or whatever? How can I make those flavors out of beer ingredients? Right. So that gives you some that sometimes just thinking in another context is helpful because you may may have a better skill set that way in terms of working with those fruits and things. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, rolling this back to the United States, how would, uh, you know, how could you take some of the lessons you've learned down in Brazil maybe and apply them to uh, to brewing here? Well, I think, you know, have fun and try and express that tropical spirit as best as you can. You certainly can get a lot of things that they that they really eat a lot of in Brazil, a mango, pineapple. Uh, you may be able to get cashew juice. I don't know. That's the, that's the, the nut actually grows out the end of a really delicious fruit that tastes a little bit somewhere like mango and pineapple uh, kind of flavor. So, so, uh, Brazil so, nuts, uh, Brazil nuts, of course, those are easily available. I know you can get, uh, uh, Tonka bean from, from stores. So that's uh, widely available. Um, you know, some of these more exotic, well, uh, uh, acai for sure. You can get, like I said, they're making a stout. It's a fairly dense, heavy kind of flavor. Uh, so you want a beer that's pretty rich uh, that can support that richness of that of that fruit, um, and uh, you know just go from there. Well, fantastic! I uh, you were kind enough to share a little bit of the manuscript for your new book that you're working on. I know I was switching yeah. topics here for a minute, sure. but uh, no problem. I was wondering if you could just talk for a minute or two about the book you got in the works. I know you've been working on it to. for quite a long time now. I, I have, and you know, working on a book is really strange because you, it it utterly dominates your life for weeks or months on end and then it goes away takes a lot and, of time and, and then it and then at some unspecified moment it flops back on your doorstep and it occupies you again so it's this really weird off again on again but uh, yeah i started working on it a little bit over a year ago uh it's going to be a nice hefty book my goal was to create what i would what what i think is a great beginner homebrew book that that has enough detail easily get people into a couple, three years of home brewing. It's not as technically uh, detailed as John Palmer's book, mm -hmm. but what, what it offers instead is a lot more focus on flavor and on recipe formulation and on how to think about beer from a, from a flavor standpoint and a, and a recipe development standpoint. So there's a huge chapter on ingredients. I've got 70 different hops in there or more that are all categorized into different groups not just by their country, but by their flavor affinities and, and, and characteristics. And each one of those groups is uh, the, the hops are put into an order. So it'll be really easy to for people to get new ideas or, well, if you can't get Rewaka this day, you can look on the chart and see what's close to that. And, and of course, everybody that brews today, uh, except people who are making Sots, Pilsners, has trouble getting hops. It seems like Sots is about the only thing you can get no matter wh where you are or when, but uh, so having those substitutions is good. I've got a malt flavor wheel in there, so you can look at all the different types of malts. Yeah, malt you're a, you're a graphic and artist, and some of the, I'm some a graphic of the, artist. So the manuscript know, I like, you showed me was rich with amazing graphics, uh, yeah, I like categorizing that. everything. I just think that there are things that the brain grasps intuitively and easily when you look at a, a picture or a chart, where to, to read text it it's just uh, much more difficult to 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 draw those conclusions and like the, the the thing that struck me and I kind of knew it existed, but it was it, once I drew the chart on malt. So I have a circle of malt that starts at zero and it ends at 500 uh, uh, in terms of color. And what you notice when you lay out all the different types of malts and just show, you know, this one goes from here to here and this one goes from here to here around the chart is that there's a gap from 80 to about 150 or 200 where they don't make malt. Right. And so so that, what that means is and the reason they don't make it is because it's got awful horrible in that range. It's really <laughs> it's really like ashtray like. Right. So it has this like just ashy campfire, really, really harsh and unpleasant. And and so that's good to know theoretically. But what that also tells you is that 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 malt that is the lightest one of the darker malts that once it picks back up and they start selling malt again. Right. That's that's chocolate malt. That's right. light chocolate malt. And and that is that malt has the most unfortunate name 
because it really should be called really sharp diner coffee malt. People, <laughs> people use a lot of chocolate malt because they think it tastes like chocolate because the name is chocolate. And that makes it logical to make that assumption. Right. But it really has, if you want chocolatey, you really need to go to black malt. So a lot of, I mean, I talk to people about their recipes and, and a common question I get is, why is this beer so harsh? And they give me a brown ale or a porter or something. And, you know, it's like, is there chocolate malt in here? Oh, yeah, I use like two, 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 pounds, two pounds of chocolate yeah. malt in here, you know, because I really like chocolate. Like, no, no, no. Chocolate malt's the most intense malt there is. And uh, so you have to be really careful with it. So, but just having that graphical presentation of information, that's a really useful little fact for everybody. Uh, so lots of things like that. I've got a spice wheel in it. I've got lots of uh, graphical charts showing different you know, uh, well, uh, really everything. If anybody out there is familiar with the old uh, Brewer's Companion that was published many, many years ago sure. by Charlie Finkel at Merchant Divan, this pick, this book picks up the spirit of that book without all the horrible typos and uh, twenty-year-old information now. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, you know, it's, I'm just trying to trying to make the great, great new book for our age. I know people are really, really interested in in recipes and in flavor and and going beyond styles this certainly has plenty of style information and there's recipes for that but but it also if you want to go go off the style pathway there's a whole chapter and a big chapter on the international beers so so there's a, a, a chapter that covers Argentina and Italy and and uh, of course Brazil and uh, a lot of other places so just to see what people are doing around the and world. As you mentioned, I mean, it's a pretty substantial book. It's not just a beginner, you know, here's how to make your first batch. Yeah, book. it's going to be 350 pages or so. It's going to yeah. be a, honk, a big honking thing. So, <laughs> <That's> big <book. laughs> well, it's a hundred, it's 133,000 words right now, if that means anything. Wow. Better. That's quite a few words. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so how, yeah. uh, so how, how far are you in the process now making the book? Well, we've, it's, it's, I've, I've written it and it's been back for one round of edit of, it's been to the editor and back. Uh, now it's back with them, but they're about done with it. They're going to back to, about to send it back to me. It's had a technical review by a chemist, but not a brewer. So I've got it uh, with uh, uh, a friend of mine up in Seattle who's, who is uh, both, a, both a biochemist and a brewer. So he's doing a quick review on it. Well, hopefully not so quick. And uh, we're looking at getting it uh, into publication by uh, sometime early next year. So, so I don't know what that means. My publisher is a little vague so, on all. So these. early, early next year, and the title yep. title's going to be uh, at this point. It's called the ha Home Brewing Handy Book. And uh, who's publishing it? Uh, it is uh, Chronicle Books in San Francisco. Okay, Chronicle Books. Yeah, so. the title actually is a bit of a nod to a really great old uh, American brewing book called the Handy Book uh, of well, the Handy Book of Brewing, uh, w which was published around 1910 or so by. Uh, uh, a company in Chicago that was a competitor of the Siebel Institute at the time. And it's just a d beautiful, dense little book, just all full of great information. And I just thought that would be kind of a kind of a fun name for this. Well, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on my copy. Hopefully yeah, you sign it for me, right, Randy? Me, me too. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. <laughs> I love signing books, you know. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I love, you know, I love that people read still, so. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Randy. I really appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. It's always great, Brad. It's great to have you, and uh, looking forward to your new book. And uh, let's see, uh, I wanted to I wanted to plug a couple of your things here. Let me let me try and get through all of them here. Uh, today, my guest was Randy Mosher. He's the author of Radical Brewing and Tasting Beer, both of which, both of which are excellent books. Uh, his website is at radicalbrewing dot com. And I mentioned your brewery, and I, I should mention the location. It's in Chicago, right? Uh, it's actually Bedford Park, but it's near Midway Airport on the south okay, side. Okay, so near Midway Airport, and it's yep. fiverabbitbrewery.com, is that right? Yes. And also has a new book coming out in February. Well, I'd like to say thank you for Randy Mosher for doing that great interview. Uh, just another reminder, if you'd like to get more, learn more about beer brewing, you can join our newsletter. We'll send you an article every single week on beer brewing. Just sign up for our newsletter in the sidebar at beersmith.com. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm -hmm.